do superheroes point to God? What about Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman? Do they reveal something about the divine? Well, my guest today, who it's been long overdue, Frank, you have not been on my YouTube channel. I don't know what's the matter with me. Maybe it took you writing the book that I should have written called Hollywood Heroes and How Superheroes Point Towards Faith. Awesome book. Good to finally have you on, man. Thanks, brother. I'm bringing my own audience with me. Here it is, right here. Okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's always great being with you, Sean. And uh, I know you love superheroes. Look at the shirt, man. Show everyone the shirt. I don't think oh, of see course, man. I had to wear Spider-Man. Are you kidding me? The amazing Spider-Man. Well, my son and I got together because he's a real movie buff. And he's also a graduate of Southern Evangelical Seminary, by the way. He's 34 yep. years old. He's in the Air Force. He got his seminary degree, and we were talking one day about all these movies that he loves, and I said, wow, this, this could be a book. And that was about five or six years ago. It took us wow. a while to pull it together. But here it is now, Hollywood Heroes, How Your Favorite Movies Reveal God. So we're here, here, here we are. It's coming out on Tuesday, but people can pre-order it right now. Well, we're going to get into how they, they can do that, and we're going to take some questions as we work through this. But I got mm -hmm. a lot of questions for you, and one of them is you've written right. apologetics books stealing from God. I don't have faith to be an atheist. Is this book apologetics? Is it evangelism? Is it discipleship? What makes this book unique? Yes. <laughs> it's all of the above. <laughs> okay. Right. Here, all right. Here's what we wanted to do, Sean. Here's the unique thing about it. Uh, here, are the, here are the movie franchises we cover. We cover Captain America, Iron Man, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Batman, Wonder Woman, and we have other heroes thrown in, like Spider-Man is in there a little bit. You know, Superman is in there as well. Uh, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to show people that the greatest story ever told has is being retold again and again, even by movie makers who are personally not Christians. They can't help but make movies that really mm. show how we need somebody to come and take us from this broken world, take us to the promised land. We all want that. We all desire that. And that's what these movies do. So this, in this book, we not only point out how these movies do that, but we're pointing out uh, apologetic issues. We have actually arguments for God in here. We have arguments yeah. for morality in here. We have arguments for design in here. We have arguments against materialism in here. They're all weaved through, arguments for the resurrection. They're all weaved through the chapters. So yes, it's, okay. it's a little bit of all of it. Uh, love it. And we're going to get into some of that, but I've got to ask a question I've been asked because not long ago, I did a review with a friend of mine, Brett Merkakin, of the recent The Batman film. And we approached yes. it the way you're talking about. There's themes of justice. There's themes of leaving the darkness and going to the light. There's biblical themes woven through this film. Now, whether the director and creator did this intentionally or not is a separate question. I think I'm with mm -hmm. you that I would say people are made in the arms of God and can't escape the reality they live in God's world. And to tell great stories is going to intersect with the gospel. But some of the feedback that people gave, comments, not a lot, but a few, are like, Sean, how can you encourage people to watch these violent films that have non-Christian themes within them? Aren't you doing the same thing in your book, Frank? Hey, the Bible has violence in it and non-Christian themes in it. Are you supposed to read it? Now, is that, yeah, a, pa <laughs> is that a Pauline rhetorical question or is that, okay. No, I mean, really, I mean, okay. just because there's, there's a lot of violence in the Bible too, right? But mm. it's descriptive, it's not prescriptive. It's not telling us to be violent. It's just describing what has happened. And I think we can use things that are in the culture by mature audiences, by the way, I'm not saying that every kid ought to watch all this stuff, right? right. I'm not saying that, sure. you know, some of this stuff has to be age appropriate, quite obviously, but you can use things in the culture to point to the truth. And I think that's what these movies do properly understood where they do point to the truth. You can point it out where they don't, you can say, well, that's an error, but actually that's a, that's a lesson too. And I love what our, mm. our friend Oz Guinness says, you know, there's something he's played with his kids and now probably his grandkids. He calls it spot the lie. So he'll watch something. Let's say he's watching a TV show and he sees, well, there's premarital sex on there and nobody ever gets hurt. Everybody's happy. There's nothing negative about it. Kids, what's this about? Is this true? Is this a lie? What's right? What's wrong? And that way he can teach these life lessons without sounding so preachy, right? Without just, mm -hmm. oh, let's get the Bible out and see what the, you can do it naturally. And I think you can do it the same way by watching these movies. 
Well, I think you do it in your book because I grew up, my family wasn't this way, but sometimes certain camps and other Christians I would interact with analyzed movies through the lens of how many cuss words are there, how much violence yeah. is there, tallied it up numerically, and that was the depth of it. But what you're saying is it's not whether you have violence or not. It's like the Bible has violence, but there's moral <laughs> lessons that come through. Like think of Judges. Right. It's mm-hmm. incredibly violent, Ooh. but it's teaching a lesson that when mm-hmm. you reject God and do what's right in your own eyes, this is what happens. So that's the question of film. But to me, even when a film shows violence and doesn't do it in a redemptive, God-honoring, lesson way, it still helps us recognize lies right. and bad ideas and something true about the world. So I think that approach is is great. So tell me, tell me this. Uh, you have yeah. a list at the beginning of your book where you've got mm-hmm. all the franchises that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. If I was going to narrow it down to one superhero or Star Wars or Harry Potter Hollywood film, what is your favorite in terms of its intersection with faith and revealing God and okay, why? Okay, personally, my favorite is Iron Man, but I know this is going to sound shocking, but the character that parallels Christ more than any other is Harry Potter. What? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah, okay. I know. That's going to be a shock to some Christians because some Christians boycotted it because of the, uh, the occult nature of uh, what's in Harry Potter. But think about this, Sean. Harry Potter... Uh, is prophesied to be the savior before he's born. He then has to live a moral life in order to accomplish saving the world. Then he has to die, and then he has to rise from the dead, and his own friends have to put their faith in him in order to defeat the evil Voldemort. Now, gee, does that sound familiar? In fact, J.K. Rowling, who wrote the whole series, said you can— you can, the, he, she said the entire series is epitomized by two Bible verses which are found in the series. One is— The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. That's from 1 Corinthians 15. It's actually on Harry Potter's parents' tombstone. And the second is where where the treasure is, there will your heart be also from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. She said the entire series can be epitomized by those two verses. She said, but I don't like to talk about it a lot, or I didn't like to talk about it a lot, because I didn't want to give our readers a tip-off as to where this was going. She said, these are very British books, so you're going to find this Christian theme throughout it. So to a Christian who's listening, it's like, oh, cool. This affirms my faith. It makes sense how I see the world. Why is this point about Harry Potter and the gospel ideas wed within it relevant to Christianity? I mean, she could have wedded in Muslim ideas, could have wedded in other movies, wed in atheist ideas. So why does it matter in terms of an apologetic that you find Christian ideas in this movie and others? Well, it's not so much an apologetic point uh, other than to say that this is the way the world really is, that we are fallen and we do need a savior and someone needs to come and save us because we can't save ourselves. We're all fallen. Notice that Harry Potter is the one that doesn't fall toward temptation like his friends do. Hmm. Uh, Just like, by the way, in The Lord of the Rings, right? The, the, the weakest heroes in Lord of the Wings are Frodo and Sam. And although Frodo at the very end falls to temptation, then Gollum comes in and, and, and messes up the, tries to mess up what Frodo's doing. And somehow it works out in the end. There's the ripple effect where evil actually comes in and does good. But we see these Christian themes in these movies and those Christian themes, I think, are put, first of all, it was put in the movie on purpose by Tolkien, because Tolkien, as you know, was a, a Christian, and he was a Catholic. And uh, with regard to Rowling, she's a member, Rowling, I don't know how she pronounced her name, but um, with, uh, she's a member of the Church of England, and although she might not be an evangelical, she's saying that basically the Bible, the Bible story is behind the Harry, whole Harry Potter series. Mm. Okay. All right. So tell me a little bit what you mean by C.S. Lewis's true myth and explain that. And then after Mm -hmm. you explain it, what I know a lot of people who aren't Christians would rightly say, they'd say, wait a minute, you just said Harry Potter in this story was prophesied and uh, predicted and did all these roles that match up with Christ and it's fictional. So why don't you apply the same thing to Christianity? Okay, yeah, 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 good good point. Uh, first of all, the true myth language comes from J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote the Lord of the Rings series. 
he and C.S. Lewis were friends. They were in a group called the Inklings, and they used to meet and discuss what they were uh, writing. Uh, and at one point, Tolkien noticed that Lewis was enthralled with these dying and rising God myths. Now, these dying and rising God myths came after Christianity, but Lewis was enthralled with them. And at one point, Tolkien said, why are you enthralled with the dying and rising God myth uh, when it's in these fictional stories, but you're not enthralled with it when you find it in the New Testament? Hmm. It turns out that the New Testament story really happened. It's the true myth. And Lewis became convinced of this, and as you know, became the, probably the top apologist other than your dad in the 20th century, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> actually, I, I, my first apologetics was with your dad. It wasn't with C.S. Lewis, so I'm just I'm throwing that in there, okay? Awesome. That's how I, I came to faith by reading Evidence Demands a Verdict and More Than a Carpenter, and I know you and your dad have mm. updated both of those. So, But in, in, in any event, Lewis said, yes, it's the true myth. Christianity really happened, and the reason why I don't think Christianity is a myth is because there's evidence that it really happened. And Evidence Demands okay. a Verdict points that out. Our book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, points that out. And as I just mentioned, okay. these dying and rising gods come after Christianity, not before. Fair fair enough. And by the way, there's a lot mm -hmm. of things I would push back that you say, Frank, but my dad being the goat, I'm going to let that one go. No, <laughs> no question about it, man. Now, uh -huh. my favorite superhero movie by far mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. Infinity War. Because mm, Infinity okay, War, it begins with Thanos having a Thor, and Loki has to make a decision whether or not he's going to give up the, uh, the stone, one of the Infinity mm -hmm. Stones, or allow Thanos to kill his brother. Fast forward. Star-Lord has to make a decision. At Gamora's request, will he end her life to prevent Thanos from getting the Soul Stone? Fast right. forward, there's a stone in Vision, and Vision, Scarlet right. Witch has to make a decision. Will we destroy the stone that will end his life to prevent Thanos from getting power? Same decision with Doctor Strange and Iron Man. And what's mm -hmm. interesting is when they're up about to, they discover to get the soul stone, you have to sacrifice something you love. What does Gamora say to Thanos? She says, this is not real love, or this is not true love. Mm -hmm. What does Captain America say? We're not in the business of exchanging lives. Yeah, that's right. The we don't trade lives. The question in Infinity War is what is the value of a human life and when can we sacrifice it? That movie, mm -hmm. as you know, climaxes in Endgame with mm -hmm. Iron Man laying that's down right. his life, the one mm -hmm. in 14 million possibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of true myth that Lewis is talking about, the point mm -hmm. that you're making is saying – Maybe. This doesn't prove Christianity is true. Of course not. You can find these stories in other religions, but maybe it suggests something about the world that love really is sacrifice. Maybe yes. we are in a cosmic battle and mm -hmm. maybe we tell these stories because it's written on our hearts so deeply we can't escape it. That's why it's my favorite movie, but that's really the heartbeat of your book is you're making mm -hmm. these connections for people, trying to help them see these things in all these films that suggest maybe they should take another look at the Christian story. Well, yeah, imagine if Tony Stark at the end of Endgame said, you know what, I'm going to follow my heart and go back to Pepper and just hang out, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Maybe I won't be. Maybe I'll I'll be one of the the half that won't get killed by Thanos or whatever. I'll be fine. Nobody would be enthralled with that. We'd all go, "What a chicken! What a coward!" Right? Mm. But when we see somebody lay down his life to save his friends, that universally, I don't care what religion or what worldview you have. You could even be an atheist. You go, "Man, that's beautiful!" Right? Mm. That's beautiful. That person sacrificed himself to save his friends. Well, Jesus sacrificed himself to save not only his friends, but his enemies. That's all of us, mm -hmm. right? And he says the greatest love is to sacrifice yourself to save Amen. your friends. That's what it is. And that theme, see, that's the greatest story ever told. That theme runs through all of these movies. Every one mm -hmm. of these superhero and fantasy movies, you, you, you see sacrifice as necessary for salvation. And the reason it's necessary in our world for salvation it's because if infinite justice exists, and it does, it's God's nature, he can't allow injustice to go unpunished. He has to punish somebody, otherwise he's not just. So what does he do? He punishes himself. He takes the punishment on himself. That way he can be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So his infinite justice and infinite love 
uh, can only be resolved if somebody takes the punishment for us, and it, it turns out to be him. And that's what Iron Man does. That's what all, all these uh, superhero hero movies eventually mm. do. They wind up, somebody's going to sacrifice themselves to save others. That's the beauty of it. So I'm going to ask you a question I know you've thought about writing this book, but I'll give you part of my two cents first, and you can mm -hmm. add to this. Is I've often mm -hmm. asked myself, why do we not only love movies, but love mm -hmm. superhero movies so much? My kids do. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many opening nights we were at at midnight to watch the recent Spider-Man <laughs> Infinity oh, yeah. War when I, I'm like, I want to do it with my kids, but I don't want to be up that late. Like uh -huh, It uh -huh. was super, super fun. Why do we love this? I think part of it is is these movies aren't really about defeating Thanos. They're about relationships of the Avengers. The mm -hmm. deepest yearning in the human heart is for relationships. And mm -hmm. this generation mm -hmm. feels like they know Tony Stark. They know right. Bruce Banner. Right. They know Black Widow. And you see these relationships and we've been made by God for relationships. So that's something that suggests to me something about what it means to be human. I think we also mm -hmm. want to believe that Batman's going to come and save the day. We see the war going oh, on yeah. in Ukraine. We see sex, abuse, and trafficking. And we want somebody. We deeply yearn for justice so deeply. Although in real life, the idea of somebody dressing up and going to get the bad guy is actually somewhat frightening. In a movie, it works because we so deeply want justice. Would you add anything to that, why you think we love superheroes so much? Or take away from that if you disagree. No, 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 I agree. That's what we say in the book, that we all want to be mm. taken from this broken world. We want we want the bad guys to be punished, and we want to be taken to a place of bliss. And that's why all these movies work, because that's 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 what our, our, our greatest desire is. And I love what C.S. Lewis said about this. He said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world mm. can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. We were made for another world. That's why we have these little glimpses of heaven, Sean. It's hard to describe what these are, but we all have them. I know sometimes, say, in the spring, you go outside and you get your first whiff of fresh-cut grass, and something just happens, and you go, spring is here, or flowers, or you see something, you see a beautiful sight, or you have a, a moment with your wife, or you have a moment with your children that just seems to transcend just basic everyday life, and you go, this is a glimpse of something beyond this world. Maybe the reason we have those is because we were made for another world. That's mm. what C.S. Lewis is saying, and I think that's true, and that's why these movies resonate. Well, let's get into some uh, of these particulars like Captain America and mm -hmm. Iron Man. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to get your thoughts mm -hmm. on how you think they point towards God. But for those watching, mm -hmm. we're going to take some questions as we move. So think of your questions, write it down. I see some awesome ones and write, write question in caps to make sure we don't miss it. Uh, so let's, right. talk, let, let's start with an easy one uh, in some ways. How do you think Captain America and that story reveals God? Well, first of all, Captain America has a character arc where he is morally consistent the entire way. Unlike Tony Stark, who needs to develop yep. his character, to uh, uh, Captain America is going to jump on a grenade for you right away. Mm. He is the one that has this sense of righteousness. You never have to say, is Captain America going to do the right thing? You know he's going to do the right thing. In fact, he's so going to do the right thing that sometimes he'll actually switch sides, like in Civil War, <laughs> you know? <laughs> He'll say, now the government, he used to be the poster boy for government. Now he's right. like, no, government's bad here, right? Because he is so righteous that he has to do what's right. It's part of his nature. He has to join the, the service in World War II, despite the fact that he can hardly pick up a coconut, right? He's a weakly, okay? Because he, he feels it's his duty. He's going to do what's right. Now, this for us is a picture of Jesus, except he, he's not morally perfect like Jesus, right? He still can be... He can split hairs too much and, 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 and frustrate people. But generally, he's the righteous one. And he will sacrifice himself. In fact, he, he's going to sacri sacrifice himself for Bucky when Iron Man wants some blood from Bucky. Yes. Remember that part? You know, Iron Man says, Bucky, you killed my parents. I'm going to nail you, right? Even though Bucky was, was not in his right mind when he was doing it. What is, what is Captain America doing? He's saying, I'm, I'm with you to the end, Bucky. I'm not going to give up on you even though Iron Man wants his pound of pound of flesh. So he is demonstrating that he is going to jump on a grenade. He is going to take the, 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 the punishment on himself 
even to save a friend who is even guilty of the crime, which is what mm. Jesus does. You know, it's interesting to think about characters in the Bible that might be akin to Captain America, probably somebody like Daniel, somebody like Joseph. Mm -hmm. But God also mm -hmm. uses Samson. He also uses David. Uh, interesting to make those comparisons. My favorite scene of Captain America, probably, probably my second favorite MCU movie is Captain America 2, where you mm -hmm. see, first off, the Winter Soldier is a great villain. He discovers the villain is his best friend, and at the end... Captain America stops wailing on him and says, if I'm going to save my friend, it's like he spreads his arm out in this Christ type figure and just oh, yeah. lets him wail on him. And I watched, I was like, oh my gosh, that is love. That's mm -hmm. what Jesus did in the cross. It's such a beautiful depiction of mm -hmm. sacrificial love. Uh, let me, I'm going to jump to a question maybe earlier than we should have, but this is a great question. I want to know what you All think. Right, uh, oops, that's not where I meant to head. Let me pull this up. Pell's Press says, do you believe that anti-God themes in superhero movies, a.k.a. Thor, discredits your opinion? I'm trying to see what he means by anti-God themes related to Thor. What would that, what do you mean by that? I, I, I need the Greg Kokel so, tactic here. So I, I would have to guess, maybe he would, the, mm -hmm. the theme of Thor moving from being this hero and accepting this destiny that's being given to him to just following his heart it seems in the most recent film dis film discovering my own journey in a more modern oh, kind of fa yeah. that would be my best guess of what he's going no at. i would say those characters are valuable because that's what tony stark is by the way look uh t tony stark has everything that most americans want he's got money he's got power he's got a great girl but he's he's empty inside he's miserable right in fact uh, jay uh, i mean um uh, Robert Downey Jr. says, this guy has everything, but he's spiritually dead inside. We have several quotes from, from uh, Jr. In the, in the Hollywood Heroes book about the character, which, by the way, paralleled his own life. You know, Robert Downey Jr. and Tony Stark are yeah, like the right. same people. <laughs> okay? And, yeah. and John Favreau, who directed that and plays Happy, the Happy Hogan, who's the security guard of Tony Stark in the movie. He's the director. He said... We need to get Downey for this for this for this uh, Tony Stark uh, character because he'll play it perfectly. And the, originally, the the studio didn't want him, but they finally convinced him. And if they hadn't picked Downey in the beginning, I don't know if we'd have many Marvel superhero movies because Iron I Man agree. picked it off. Right? right there's the ripple effect right there. Downey Jr. was the perfect guy for the role. Yep. In any event, from if I look at Iron Man, Iron Man or Tony Stark is more like us. We need development. We need to be sanctified to become heroes. Whereas Captain America is that way the whole time. Now, Thor takes a dive, right? How is Thor, is Thor ever going to be redeemed? I don't know. We'll see, right? Isn't there, a, I think there's a Thor movie coming out shortly. It is, okay? yeah. So, yeah, well, well, I, I think that when we see these characters who are who are, although they're superheroes, they're not perfect. When we see them go through struggles, that's that that actually is valuable too. So Tony Stark goes through struggles. And mm. in fact, here, here's one of my favorite things about Iron Man. I got to say this because I think it's so profound um, in the movie. Uh, we, we know that Tony Stark's an amoral playboy, arms dealer. He's, his company sells weapons to the terrorists. One of those weapons actually hurts Tony, as you know. Then he has to have a device implanted into his heart to protect the heart, to guard the heart from encroaching shrapnel. If that thing doesn't guard his heart, he's dead. Well, you know what our culture says? Our culture says, uh, if you want to have a, a fulfilling life, you need to follow your heart. Well, this visual reminder right in Tony Stark's chest says that's not true. You need to guard your heart. The mm. proverb, Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. If you follow your heart like Tony Stark was doing, you're going to wind up empty. You're going to wind up lost. You're going to wind up somebody who is full of anxiety and despondent. If you want to have a life that's going to make a difference, you got to guard your heart. You got to direct it toward reliable and good ends. You can't just flit away and do whatever you want whenever you want. You got to have moral restraints around your heart. And I just love that illustration because I think the second most important Bible verse that young people need to hear today after the gospel itself is you need to guard your heart, not follow your heart. And Tony Stark shows us how to do that. 
It's interesting that that in Iron Man 2 is also about his discovery and relationship with his father involving mm-hmm. getting a new heart. There's some powerful biblical themes there. One thing I'd oh, yeah. say to this, if we believe that anti-God themes and superheroes like Thor discredit your opinion, no, because scripture is full of anti-God characters. We would expect there to be such characters. Now, I would ask if Thor continues to go an anti-God direction over the next five to ten years, will we love and yearn and connect with that story as deeply as we do the first ten mm-hmm. years? I would say no. So we expect, and that's your point earlier about if Iron Man at the end hadn't taken a sacrificial Christ type mm-hmm. response, our experience would have been very different. So that's a distinction I think I think we can make. Uh, we'll come back to some some more questions, but let me get your thoughts on a few more characters. Uh, you've talked about Iron Man. Uh, I got to tell you, Frank, I'm offended. There's no Spider Man chapter in here. <laughs> what on earth is happening? Well, uh, why actually, didn't you have a chapter on Spider Man? I love Spider-Man for you, Sean. Actually, though, the first character we talk about in the book, as you know, because you endorsed the book, uh, Hollywood Heroes, the first character we talk about is Spider-Man, but he's in the introduction. And okay. something that happens in Spider-Man's life is one of the things that help us understand why God allows evil. In fact, uh, this what, what what happens to Peter Parker, obviously, when he when he first gets these these powers is he's a teenager so what's he using them for he's using it to impress girls right he's using it to win fights you know that's what he's using he's using it for his own personal benefit but uncle ben says to him i think in the new movie though instead of uncle ben it's aunt may it's it's the same thing they they basically say to him with much power comes much responsibility right so what happens to peter parker he neglects stopping a thief and long story short, this thief actually kills his Uncle Ben, and I think in the new movie, his Aunt May, right? Spoiler alert, does he kill Aunt May? I don't know. In 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 in, in the earlier Spider-Man movie, it's Uncle Ben. Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. In any event, so as Spider-Man is watching Uncle Ben die on the on the sidewalk, it comes back to him. The last words Uncle Ben spoke to him was with great power comes great responsibility. At that point, Spider-Man is born. If that mm-hmm. evil hadn't occurred, Spider-Man would still be some selfish teenager using these powers for his own good. But the evil occurred, it rippled forward to affect Spider-Man and changed him and saved so many thousands of people uh, because of the effect it had on Spider-Man. So here's an instance where we can see how evil can bring forth good There are many instances where we see evil and we can't see any good coming from it, but due to the ripple effect, it ultimately can bring forth good. That's such a great example. I had not thought of it and made that connection until I read that part, I think, as you mentioned at the end of your book. But for me, Spider-Man, one of the reasons I love Spider-Man is, number one, he's sarcastic, and I think sarcasm (laughs) is the sixth love language. I just, you Uh know... I, I'm sarcastic as, by as nature. As Iron Man. As is Iron Man. <laughs> Iron Man is in a different fashion. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh, uh-huh. But the ethic with great power comes great responsibility. Mm-hmm. Jesus said, he who's given much, much is required. That's, That's right. a biblical idea that we have been oh, given yeah. gifts. And because of that gift with power, we are to care for those with less power. That's mm-hmm. a Christian ethic. And you see that in Spider-Man. He's got these new powers. How do I use it for good? And that's akin to the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of grace. And that's all wedded through the ethic of Spider-Man. Let's, uh, you know, let me ask this question right now. We might as well. It's come up. Others are going to ask it. We're going to take more at the end, but might as well do this. Uh, Miguel Araya, uh, sorry if I said it wrong, Miguel. Wonderful question. Do you think more woke culture in superhero movies is going to point the opposite direction from God? It might. However, I will say this. Even the woke movies are going to have to have sacrifice Mm. and self-giving love in order to make an impact on people. Otherwise, people are going to go, I'm just being preached to, man. Right. This is this is this is not going to be an enjoyable, entertaining or uplifting experience. If all you're going to tell me about is all your little injustices that you think are in the world and nobody ever sacrifices to fix any of them. Sacrifice is at the center of what of of what attracts us what enchants us 
And that's because that's the way the real world is. That's that's what Jesus had to do. That's a, that's a great point. Even if it goes woke with certain themes embedded within the film and they feel mm -hmm. obligated like Star Wars and the Eternals to have a certain kiss, even in those films, there's larger, deeper Christian ideas mm -hmm. that are inescapable mm -hmm. to tell mm -hmm. a great story. I think that's fair. Part of my question has been, uh, and I don't know exactly where movies will be in the next three to five years, but I used to watch with my kids, uh, we watched The Flash and Supergirl. And when Flash came out, the CW TV shows, I loved it. And they had, you know, a guy lives with his girlfriend. Uh, they had a gay character. But my kids and I never felt preached at. I watched mm. that. I think we live in a pluralistic society. There's people that are different from me. They don't have to cater just to me. I was completely fine with it. And it gave me an opportunity with my kids to just talk about these ideas. And then I started watching Supergirl with my daughter. I thought, here's a cool way to just watch, you know, a girl who's powerful. She's cool, fighting for justice. And my daughter and I couldn't watch it anymore because they sacrificed the quality of the storytelling to push a certain lesbian relationship. And ironically, Frank, I was having, mm. <laughs> I was having lunch with an atheist friend of mine who you know – and I just won't mention his name to, to call right. him out here, but we both agreed. He's like, you know what? I actually can't watch that either. I didn't enjoy it. It's bad storytelling, even if I morally assess some of these ideas differently. So there's a lot of questions at play. Number one, if they push woke ideas, like you said, are they still going to escape deeper Christian truths? But there's also the question, are they just going to lose good storytelling by doing the very thing that evangelicals have been criticized of in Christian films, which is preaching and having wooden characters, <laughs> now they're doing it back on us. Well, you know the interesting thing too, Sean. C.S. Lewis has it. C.S. Lewis has this famous quote. It's in this book. I just haven't have it next to me because I've been going through it again. Abolition of Man. Great. You book. know, yeah, great book. Anyway, he has this quote where he says something like. Um, any new value system is stolen from the ultimate value system, which he called the mm. Tao or natural law. And he says when people invert their values, what they wind up doing is they, they, they wrench uh, a good thing out of its context and they swell it to madness and isolation. And so everything must uh, bow to this value, whatever it is. And as we know, a lot of the values of our culture today have to do with sex. So what happens is, in, in, instead of telling a good story, they have to take that one value they have, which is a good thing. Sex is a good thing. Now, now they're, they're distorting it a little bit and taking it another direction. But now they're trying to make that the center of the story because it's been swollen to madness and isolation, mm -hmm. and it blows everything up. And you go, this just is unwatchable. Man, okay, I see what, you, I see what you're trying to do here. You, you, you can't tell a compelling story anymore because you've taken this one good thing and you've blown it up so big that it's, it's, it's just crowding out everything else, including mm. the story. That's a good way to put it. But the one thing mm -hmm. that can't are deep gospel truths of sacrifice and love mm -hmm. for another. You can never make that too central no, in no. a great story. No, no, if that story. is the center, so. that's not swollen to madness. That mm. is the goal. That is the ultimate love. That's why it always works. But when you try and take a sub value and distort it and swell it to madness, then everyone goes, forget about it. This is just mm. propaganda. Mm -hmm. Let's shift in, in your analysis to a couple of DC characters. Mm -hmm. uh, Batman, tell me some of the points yeah. you draw from Batman that you think point towards God. Well, first of all, I think Batman has the most real, realistic worldview of virtually any of these movies because notice Batman mm -hmm. is trying to make Gotham safer and he's locking up bad guys, but he can never take a rest. Why? Because human nature is so mm -hmm. evil that no matter how much he works, He's never going to create utopia on Earth because human nature is evil. Locking up bad guys is not going to create human nature. It's not going to create utopia on Earth because we do have this fallen nature. We also point out that I know a lot of people didn't like this movie, but Batman versus Superman has so many questions that are addressed in there that are apologetic center front front and center questions. Uh, for example, uh, if there's a good God, why is there evil? Lex exactly. Luthor. Exactly. Yes. Lex Luthor is is the is the yep. villain 
And the reason Batman is fighting Superman is because he thinks Superman, who is the god of this universe, is a bad god because Superman didn't stop Lex Luthor's father from abusing him as a child. So he wants to get back at God. So what does he do? He sicks Batman on him. Now, Batman has a, has a contingency plan for everything, right? He has a contingency plan because he knows, he knows that human nature is evil. So he's even going to take out superheroes if they go rogue. Batman even has a contingency plan to take himself out if he goes rogue. So he thinks Superman's going rogue. So what is he going to do? He's going to try and take him out. Now, here's the ironic thing about all this. Uh, Lex Luthor's asking the question, you know, why doesn't God stop evil? And he's all mad that, that, that Superman didn't stop his father. But notice that Lex Luthor is not mad that, that God isn't stopping him, Lex Luthor, from doing evil. <laughs> you know, why is that? And we have the same problem. Don't we always point at other people who are doing evil? Hey, God, why don't you stop him? God, why don't you stop her? We never say, God, why don't you stop me? As our mutual friend Greg Kokel mm. says, if God were to stop evil at midnight tonight, would any of us be alive at 12.01? Right? Mm. I wouldn't be. Anyway, in the book Hollywood Heroes, we unpack all this. We point out, you know, we answer the question, why does God allow evil? We answer the question, you know, why, why does God allow certain evils? And we and, and the Batman movie deals with that directly. It's, 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 or Batman movies, particularly that one, deals with it directly. So we get into that quite a bit. Yeah, almost every Batman movie is about mm -hmm. revenge and evil and how we fix it and corruption. But Batman vs Superman, it's more explicit. Where Lex Luthor oh, it, states, the, "I list," I was like, yeah. "What? He is saying it that this is what it's about." So that movie he's comes out. He's he's saying if there yeah. is a good God, why is there evil in the world? You mm -hmm. know. Except you noticed in the new Batman movie, in the end, he said, "Well, vengeance is not enough. What people need is hope." They need, they need to, they need to know that there's someone out there fighting for them. They need hope. And you know the scene with the torch where he's leading them out. Mm -hmm. It's all about hope. That's what people need. Look, you only have two things in life. You can either have hope or despair. That's all you can have. You know what's you amazing hope? about the end of that movie is when he gets, when he has the realization of, uh, this is the recent the Batman of the you know he pulls the mask off that bad guy and he's like i'm motivated by vengeance and it's that's where the moment where batman's like oh my goodness this is what my you know journey is going to lead to he falls back into the water and experiences a kind of baptism mm -hmm. and then gets a torch yeah. and starts leading the way whereas mm -hmm. at the beginning of the movie he wore sunglasses because he was averse to the light i mean these are biblical metaphors all oh, yeah. the way oh, yeah. through this film uh the more recent batman so i i love it i think that like captain america is kind of an easy one uh mm -hmm. so to speak there's some great questions coming through we're going to come through but let me ask you just one more about mm -hmm. wonder woman i'd love to know your thoughts on if you think wonder woman in some fashion any of the films or the comics uh point towards god yeah, because I think Wonder Woman, unlike the other superheroes, wins with two things, truth and love. That's mm. what Wonder Woman's all about. She has the lasso of truth, right? That's right. And, 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 and I know the second movie, the 1984 movie, was not as good as the first one. But if you watch the second one, mm -hmm. man, I mean, how does she overcome Max Lord in the end? What she mm -hmm. does is she convinces him that he's living a falsehood. She convinces him with truth and that he ought to follow the truth. And she doesn't follow her heart. She actually guards her heart. Remember, she has to give up Steve, her, her love interest, in order to save the world. It would, what, what, what kind of movie would it be if she said, you know, I got to follow my heart. You know, Steve's the love of my life. I'm sorry, the world's going to end or I, I can't save the world because I got to follow my heart. No, she goes, I, I, I got to follow the truth. And the truth is important. So Wonder Woman follows the truth. In the first movie, Aries says to her, they don't deserve your protection. Who, who's they? Human beings. And she goes, I know they don't deserve my protection, but it's not about deserve. It's about what you believe. And I believe in love. Boom. Um, that's exactly what Christ does. He believes in love. Mm. And it's not, he doesn't want to give you what you deserve. That is justice. He wants to give you grace. So how do you get grace? You accept what he's done. It's what you believe, not what you deserve. 
Love it. Good, good stuff. Mm-hmm. Let's ask, this is this is not directly in your book, Hollywood Worldviews, but it's a question people are asking. Marvel is owned by Disney, and mm-hmm. there's obviously direct awareness that Disney yep. is not only being inclusive in a broad sense, like you might say The Flash, but moving more towards the way Supergirl was and Mm -hmm. pushing characters in all their films, which means superheroes moving forward as well. Now, of course, what you're doing is the last decade of films analyzing them, not really predicting what's going forward. But some people have been asking, I'd be curious, uh, Darren, who's just a regular viewer, good to see you, Darren. He says, Disney pushing an agenda. Any just thoughts or wisdom or reflection on these movies coming forward uh, into the future? Yeah, I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I know Disney was trying to put out the idea that they want at least half their characters to be LGBTQ. I can tell you from a, a macro perspective, I don't think that's going to work for them financially. I mean, they want, may want to do that. Uh, I think it was Ben Shapiro who said, go bro- uh, go woke, go broke, right? <laughs> I, I think mean, he did. You know, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to, I mean, if, if that, it's, it's just like the Supergirl thing you were talking about before, Sean, you know? If that's going to be the center of these films, that is just, it's not going to appeal to people because, again, it's a value swollen to madness and isolation that is going to basically crowd out what a good story is about. So uh, if they're going to do that moving forward, I think they're going to be in trouble. And I, I am looking back at the last decade of movies, actually probably the past three decades of movies, because we go back to Star Wars. We talk a lot about Star Wars in this in this uh, film set as well. Actually, it's four decades now. I mean, I can't believe how long it's been. Uh, And uh, so we talk about Star Wars. We talk about uh, Lord of the Rings and uh, Harry Potter and all these movies. So Hollywood Heroes covers that. I don't know what the future is, but I think you can certainly get a lot of value, particularly with young people, by using this book and these movies to get young people more interested in God, more interested in Christianity, and showing them that the things they really love are actually true about the real world, that there is a savior and he's going to come rescue you. I agree 100%. I did a chapel for my son who's nine years old, and I talked about Daniel, and my whole opening was talking about superheroes and connecting it to the Bible. And these like first, second, third, fourth graders were like glued because I was talking about superheroes. It just uh-huh. made it come alive to them. So all ages – You've done a great service of helping us think through some of these questions practically. The kinds of conversations I've had with kids and many people don't share my faith over the past 10 years as as well. Uh, in a minute, we're just going to we're going to come to the questions. So go ahead and throw the questions in here. Just put question in caps and we'll give it over to Frank. But Frank, you mentioned Star Wars when I was a kid. I remember some of the concerns about Star Wars was the new age pantheist worldview that was coming through. And it is clearly evident, especially in like Empire Mm -hmm. Strikes Back uh, and some of the more recent films, this kind Mm -hmm. of Buddhist Eastern kind of element. Uh, But you argue a little differently that there's actually some deeper Christian themes in it. Tell me why. Oh, sure there is. Yeah, sure there is. You know, Lucas was brought up as a Christian. I don't think he is now. And, and his goal was to try and get kids to think about God. And he said, I don't want to have any particular God in mind, but it was unavoidable. You know, his God is like more of a pantheistic God, kind of a Zen Buddhist kind of situation where there's a good and the bad side. And it works better if you, if, if you work with the good side. But the, the force is not is morally neutral. The, the, the force is morally neutral. The force doesn't issue commands. It just seems to work out better that if you if you tap into the good side, things will go better for you. Uh, while the force is morally neutral, the audience is not, right? Why? When we show up at a theater, we automatically know who the good guys and bad guys are. Why? Because God has written that on our hearts. Mm-hmm. So why Lucas may try and say, well, you know, we're just going to be, uh, we're just going to be uh, neutral about all this. When we get to the theater, we go, okay, Jedi are the good, Sith are the bad. We we get it. And notice, by the way, what Lucas does in the movies. If you're on the bad side, uh, he uh, the, the evil is expressed physically in the creatures. Uh, like, for example, Darth Vader is on a breathing machine. He's deformed. He has to have covering all over himself because he's gone into evil and that has expressed itself in his physical appearance. The Emperor, Emperor, Emperor Palpatine, whatever his name is, right? He's all wrinkled up and he's, he's, his evil is expressed in his 
physical appearance. But you look at somebody like Luke, he's, he's pure. And Lucas is communicating that there are consequences to evil behavior, and he's doing that through the physical appearance of, of, of these individuals. So I, I think that's quite interesting. We also cover the redemption of not only Han Solo, but the redemption of Darth Vader. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> they've had plenty of time he's redeemed um, by his son yeah so uh who is uh who is luke hey, skywalker here's a really interesting comment not really a question but i'm gonna give my two cents on this and maybe some people won't like what i have to say but uh cal mccritchie says star wars mm -hmm. combines buddhism and christianity i think he's absolutely right it combines mm -hmm. both of them but i would venture to say to tell the greatest story that star wars tells they cannot rely upon Buddhist themes alone. And you're mm. going to have to pull from Christian themes, although you can tell a story just with Christian themes without pulling from Buddhist themes. What do I mean yeah, by this? Point. Not yeah. an interesting story. I'm not saying you can't tell an interesting story. But even the redemption of Kylo Ren comes from the sacrifice of Leia. I mean, that's a beautiful scene laying down her life for his redemption he sees this love and sacrifice and that's what seemingly ultimately softens his heart so calm is right that both elements are in there the buddhist new age idea is unmistakable from star wars but even as they climax the star wars film just like you said with vader there's this sense of like laying down your life to free another and love is what it takes to be pulled from the dark mm -hmm. side Mm -hmm. Those are Christian themes. Yep, yep. Also, uh, the other skeptic that gets redeemed that we cover in the book Hollywood Heroes is Han Solo, who's one of my favorite characters of all time. Mm. I mean, Han Solo, he's got all the great lines. Look, your worshipfulness. Let's get one thing straight. I take orders from just one person, me. You know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> anyway, so so he's a skeptic, right? In the beginning, he's going, oh, come on. This is all simple tricks and nonsense, kid. None of this stuff is real. It's always great to have a good blaster at your side. That's what you need, kid, right? Well, he comes full circle later, right? Later on in the later films, he's going, it's all true, kid. It's all true. How is it all true? Two things happened to him. He got redeemed by luke who came to basically get him out of debt from jabba the hut who by the way is way bigger than a hut he luke actually gets him out of debt by killing jabba the hut he's no longer in debt right he's out of debt and that mm -hmm. i think motivates han to take a closer look at what's going on and then he sees the evidence that the force is real well, we should do the same thing we should come to the truth by looking at the evidence and that's what han does mm -hmm. I've got a more kind of pastoral or personal question for you that's kind of, that mm -hmm. I think is really interesting. One I've, I've kind of inter engaged with students on is uh, Jem K says, what would you say to a kid who wishes that they could have powers and that is an idol in their lives that they wish they were something they were not? Hmm. I would say to the kid, maybe you could look at somebody like um, Tony Stark who has everything, right? He's got everything we would want. He's got he's got the girl, he's got the money, he's got the power, and he's still miserable. Because you cannot fill an infinite hole with a temporal thing, with a finite thing. Uh, so the power uh, that you could have, and he had plenty of power, right? He had the suits, he had the money, he could do whatever he wanted, and he was not miserable. And by the way, I think if you look at if if you look at what's just going on in culture today, you look at people that have everything, they're miserable. Look at the Johnny Depp trial. I mean, come on. I mean, the, you, Johnny Depp was, is, was one of the best actors of his generation and had oodles and oodles of money. And the guy right now can't get out of his own way, right? I mean, how many of these, these Hollywood actors who have everything are just miserable? I love what, um, what uh, Denzel Washington said, who is a Christian, as you know. He said, fame is a monster. Mm -hmm. and it destroys people i also remember something you told me years ago sean when you went to a leadership conference in florida i remember asking you what was the biggest thing you took away from this conference and i don't know if you remember this but you said the guy said shun the spotlight as long as you can wow and i thought man that's good advice why because if we get success too early it can ruin us 
If we don't know how to handle success, if we don't know how to handle money, if we don't know how to handle power, if we don't have to know how to handle relationships, it can ruin us. And I think that's what happens. It happens to young sports stars. It happens to young movie stars. You don't want that power until you have the wisdom. And even then, you got to be careful with it. You know, there's been a, a discussion the past five years or so about people deconstructing their faith, authors mm. and worship leaders, in many cases, got a platform too early. Think about where we're going to be in five or 10 years when we've had people with a platform too early with social media and with YouTube. Oh, yeah. I think it's only going to be exponential. Mm. Uh, let, let me ask you this question. You commented on this earlier, but I love love your wisdom here. I think this is it relates uh, broadly speaking. Monica says, as an aspiring author of fantasy books, is it okay to portray sex and violence? I want to portray the raw world, but to send a good, hopeful, dark to light message. So really for anybody who's creatively telling a story, whether an author or uh, a producer of a film, is it okay to depict sex and violence in it? Why or why not? My answer is yes, but it depends on what age group you're projecting it toward. The Bible predicts or, or, or shows sex and violence in it, right? As you mentioned earlier, Sean, it's for a moral lesson. Let me let me let me ask our audience right now. You can't take a poll, but I, I think they'll get it. How many of them have seen Schindler, Schindler's List? How right. many of them have seen Saving Private Ryan? How many of them have seen Hacksaw Ridge? How many of them have seen The Passion of the Christ? You've seen all those. Why? Because you know that some things can best be communicated through the visual media rather than just the written media. Some things have to be seen rather than just told you. You have to see it to get the sense of it. Now, a good writer can be very expressive, don't get me wrong, but we see those things, those evil things that have occurred because we know that it can actually help our souls rather than hurt our souls. One of my all-time favorite lessons I do with students is I show the scenes of two different films that are R for violence. I'll mm. show a scene from The Matrix, the, uh, uh, the famous scene where they're in trench coats in the lobby and they blow away all the guards. And I'll ask them, how did that seem like? Like a video game was awesome. I want to be like Neo and Trinity. I'm like, R for violence. And then I show them the opening scene from Saving Private Ryan. Do any mm. of you want to be there? Mm. Both are rated R for mm. violence. One mm. of them is praising it and making it look cool. The other one is realistically showing the devastating effects of war to teach a moral lesson. Now, I'm not against mm. The Matrix. It is the only film I've ever seen four times in the theater. I love it. And partly that was because I didn't have kids yet. But the point is not just whether it has violence or nudity. It's how it's portrayed. So I'll ask audiences, I'll say, especially Christian audiences, is it okay to have nudity in film? No. And I'll say, what about Schindler's List? Mm -hmm. That nudity is not sexual. I think there might be a sexual scene, but in terms of what they're showing to the Jews, the point is to show how people were dehumanized. Yes. And to portray it is so we understand mm -hmm. the evil of what happened. So mm -hmm. I would just ask this person, I'd say, why are you showing it? What's the purpose of it? Does it become salacious? Like in a recent, uh, one of the recent alien films, they escape the aliens, they get on the plane, they're leaving, and then there's like a shower scene where they get attacked by the alien. I'm watching this going, really? There's no way 45 minutes after their buddies just got butchered that anybody's going to want to get in the shower and have sex when they just saved. So why right. is it in there? Because the producer wants to manipulate mm -hmm. and use that yeah. for eyes. Right. That's a very different depiction than the movie you mentioned, Hacksaw Ridge. There's a sex scene, but they don't show, they give you enough to know what's happening and they're in love. Don't show any more than is necessary. That's the key. And sometimes to make a point, more violence might be necessary. So I think of the Logan film. And at mm -hmm. first, when I saw it, it's rated R. I was like, man, this is so unnecessarily violent. I get the point. And then I realized, wait a minute. Wolverine's not fighting superheroes. He's fighting human beings. And he's at the end of his life. And this violence portrays him falling apart, having no limits, losing himself. So I actually thought the violence in the big picture of it 
was necessary in a sense of the deeper idea in mm. that film. You know, what, you know what's interesting about, about evil in particular, Sean? Evil from a distance is intriguing. Evil up close is horrifying. So mm. we will watch evil on a screen and be intrigued by it. But if it were happening to us, we would be in shock. That's why mm. your point about uh, about the Matrix, we're watching it in a theater. Oh, this is cool. But if we were at Storm in the Beaches of Normandy, we wouldn't be, we would not be going, oh man, this is cool. Can't wait to do this again. I won't do it again because I'm going to be dead, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it, yeah. It, I think sometimes the power of film is mm -hmm. even when things aren't redeemed and they're tragedies, like, I, gosh, I think it's been a while. I think the movie with Daniel Day-Lewis, There Will Be Blood, this movie ends with there's blood and the murder of this young man. And I thought this whole film, as I remember it, is basically, you know, the James idea that temptation gives birth to sin, sin when it is full grown, grown leads towards death. This movie starts with a slight temptation. It becomes consuming and it ends with death. I was like, wow, that's a biblical idea, wow. Wow. even though it's not redemptive. Those are the mm. kind of themes that, that mm. I look for. Um, uh, there's a handful of other questions here. Did I miss anything, Frank? Examples from your book that are like favorite examples, illustrations, movies that you want to make for us? I know that's a tough question to ask uh, at it, the end. Yeah, no, I, we've, we've covered a lot of it. Obviously, we can't cover everything in Hollywood Heroes, but uh, I mean, those are the seven basic uh, movie franchises we cover. Captain America, Iron Man, Harry Potter, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Batman, and Wonder Woman. And there's so much in each of those movies. And then the ultimate hero, of course, is Jesus of Nazareth, and he's in the last chapter. Hey, man, I love that you bring it towards that. Well, we're back talking about Hollywood Heroes by Frank Turek. And Frank, it's just, I should have had you on this show a long time ago. It's a shame that it takes this book for me to do it. But the moment I saw your book, I was like, man alive, he beat me to it. Good for hey. him. I hey, love it. Hey, can I say it. one thing about it? Because yeah. it comes out, it comes out on Tuesday. But here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen: if you go to HollywoodHeroesBook.com, that's HollywoodHeroesBook.com, and you pre-order this book before Tuesday, you, if you follow the cues at HollywoodHeroesBook.com, we're going to send you the audio version for free. Now, be patient; it may take us a few days to email it back to you, the audio version, but you'll get it for free. But that's only until the book comes out. It's got to be before Tuesday that you. You send us an email at HollywoodHeroesBook.com with the proof of the fact that you've actually pre-ordered the book. Mm. Frank, since we got three minutes, there's one last question here I'm going to ask you. That's great. Mm -hmm. If you pre-order it, which I think is excellent, get the audio. Uh, is fantastic. That's a good freebie. Uh, last one. Now, this is huge. What do you think about these films? So you just pick one of them and give your quick thoughts. Prince of Egypt, Ben-Hur, Silence, or the Book of Eli? Do any of those no. jump out that you have any kind of worldview Christian reflections upon? No, because I I haven't seen three of them. I've seen Ben Hur, okay. but it was so many years ago, so I'm not the right guy to ask. But you can answer that. I know. Go. Uh, the one I have not seen actually is Ben Hur. Interestingly enough. Oh, okay. So in each one of these books, I think they get in each one of these movies they get some things right, and I think they get some things wrong so prince of egypt i loved that disney was willing to take a story from the bible and as far as i know and can tell try to tell it biblically faithfully with some guesses filling in the blanks maybe like the chosen does i love that disney did that and as far as i know unless there's something about the film i just missed i think christians should jump on board and see that but always compare it to the scriptures and there's right. a scene in that it's film. Like the chosen, by the way, you ought to compare the chosen to the scriptures too. That's that's exactly yeah, right. Yeah, 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 well, in yeah. Prince of Egypt, when they're leaving, there's a song that Miriam sings that says, "Miracles will happen if you just believe." Mm -hmm. So if you believe, God will do miracles. That's the exact opposite of what Exodus teaches. God did no miracles because they believed or when they believed. He did miracles so that they would believe, mm -hmm. to give mm -hmm. them a confident faith. So even mm -hmm. with the book of Eli, I won't go into it, but there's some things that I love, but there's a little pluralism that's wedded in. There's a faulty view that faith is blind. 
So even book movies that have stars like Denzel Washington, who says he's a Christian and intersects with biblical themes, we've got to watch them with discernment and with care and use it as an opportunity with our kids and others to draw back to the scriptures themselves. Mm -hmm. That's my quick two cents. I want to respect your time, but I want to encourage folks to go pick up a copy of Hollywood Heroes. Really fun, easy read, just such a good book for a classroom, for a small group, for individual study. Uh, Would you recommend this book to give to a skeptic, or is there a different book you would say to give to someone who's not a believer? Well, actually, if they like movies, yeah. In fact, the Paul Enns, okay. a mutual friend of ours, has read it, and I did a little debate with him on Justin Brierley's show, and he had, he said he enjoyed the book. So, yeah, you can give it to a skeptic if they're open to it. It's a more of a fun book, but uh, apologetics, philosophy, theology is all weaved through the book Hollywood Heroes. So I would I would encourage anybody to get it, and youth pastors, I think, are going to find it very helpful, and, and, and parents to try and bring their kids along, get them more interested in Christianity more interested in biblical life lessons, and you can do it without being preachy. Watch a movie, do movie night and read the book. Frank, you have always been so encouraging to me from the first time we met. So I just want to say on my channel, thanks for being a good friend. Thanks for fighting for the truth, doing it creatively with books like Hollywood Heroes, but just doing it with fun and with commitment to the scriptures and just being a champion for the faith, man. Love you. Grateful for you. And I just hope everyone to pick up a, a book because I want to encourage your ministry and support it as, as best I can. Thanks, brother. Thanks so much. By the way, our website's crossexamine.org. For those of you that don't know, crossexamine with a D on the end of it. And Sean is one of my favorite people. You guys all know that. So, Sean, round of applause for you. Thank you so much for having me on the show. <laughs> Frank, you're too good, man. I, I would Last thing I would say is if people watching this on YouTube, if they're not subscribed to your YouTube channel, like they're missing out because you answer live questions uh, from people. So this is not scripted, which is really cool. So go to Frank Turk. You can just search, find his YouTube channel is awesome. And then last thing, our apologetics bio program is totally distance. It's the top rated program. And we talk about topics like this. I mm-hmm. teach class on the problem of evil and I bring in examples from Batman. I teach evidence for the resurrection and talk about infinity war. So if you've ever thought about getting a master's degree, uh, come study with us. Information is below. We would love to have you. Frank, hang on so I can just say thanks. But the rest of you, we will see you soon. A couple interviews coming up uh, you don't want to miss is one is John Fobert has a new book out. It is my hands down favorite book on to help parents help their kids with pornography. This mm-hmm. book is really researched and it's short. Interviewed him. It's powerful. Going to post that next week. And then I just got recorded earlier this morning a conversation with an atheist New York media elite. Uh, and we had a fascinating conversation, kind of like the conversations I've had here with other non believers. Going to post that soon. So if you haven't subscribed, make sure you hit subscribe. And if you enjoy this conversation, know somebody enjoys superheroes, we'd be honored if you shared it with them. You guys have a great day.